When I make a mug, I love the notion that somebody's going to get up in the morning and pick out that mug because it speaks to them for whatever reason and it fits their hand right and it's balanced and it, it, the colors and whatever design it happens to have gives them a warm feeling. Uh, it, it starts their day off right and that's not a big thing, it's not a, it's not a world shaker. But that connection that I had and the enjoyment of making that and hoping that somebody's going to enjoy using that as their favorite mug uh, is just really meaningful to me. I'm just kind of guessing as to what I need I'm, and I might run it through and it needs to be a little softer or a little firmer. Potters often, or beginners, think, oh, I have to have all this equipment and, and you don't really. I mean, it's, it's nice to have this. It's taken us 40 years of accumulating, you know, to have the equipment we have. It's kind of like a musician saying they have, you know, well, I'd be a great great musician, if I did, great guitarist if I just had a, <laughs> you know, the right guitar. No, it's not the tools. It's, the tools are nice, but I started out a school teacher, taught chemistry and physics and math, and started getting interested in pottery during that time. Started reading and started visiting every potter I could find, and I finally built a potter's wheel and got hooked. Part of what I liked was the smell of the clay. That earthy smell, it was like, it reminded me a lot of the library when I was a kid in the basement of the courthouse. That old musty smell of an old library and books. Clay smells a lot like old books. And there was a lot of romance from growing up as a kid in that library. I think that was probably part of it. And I liked the feel of the clay. Uh, I also liked the unlimited possibilities with clay. I mean, a pound and three quarters. If you look up in the Department of Labor, if you, looked up, if you look up pottery, they have lists of occupations. If you look up and they, they categorize them, pottery is listed as manual labor, and that is no accident, <laughs> because it is. It's, uh, it's, uh, I don't know many potters without back problems and wrist problems and neck problems and you know from a lot of lifting and, and all, the, all that you do. Okay. Sitting down and working at a wheel uh, does just take you back. Uh, it, it ties you historically to so many civilizations. People will say, uh, well, were you self-taught? And, well, I was in many ways because I didn't study it in school, but I learned from so many potters and so many books and so many magazines. I, I tell people I graduated from the University of Ceramics Monthly is a magazine that all potters take. Well, I'm not thrilled with the line I got left right in there, but we may not get rid of it. Let's see here. Yeah, we may. I will not brag about seeing being self-taught because a lot of times when people say, well, I was self-taught, I want to say, yeah, I can tell. You know, it's, it's, there's, there's nothing wrong with a really good <laughs> ceramic education. This one I made yesterday and let it sit all day. And so it's what you call leather hard. The British call it cheese hard, which is a good description. It's about like cheese. So it, it's soft, it's still moldable. I do mainly functional work functional in the sense of utilitarian. I like to make kitchenware and serving pieces and f pieces to eat off of. One of the reasons I like to make that kind of ware is I like that kind of hospitality, that functional ware. It's an offering, it's a serving. Okay, I'm gonna take this, we're gonna stick a handle on it. And just jam it on there. Get it balanced like I want it. Get the size right. 
what I make is not a necessity anymore. I'm fooling myself to think that it is. Uh, you know, I'm not making things that anybody has to have. I like to think their soul needs it, but, but physically you don't, you don't have to have it. I don't know why people always assume the man is the one who does all the doing, you know. Barbara has much higher art skills than I do and carries well over 50% of the load of, of, the, of the work probably that goes on. There, there are times she doesn't get the credit that she needs uh, for having made this work as long as it has, both, both just us still being together and the work of the, of the success of the shop. Uh, we made, you know, oil lamps were always something that's so we don't make anymore, but we developed one that was an angel oil lamp. In fact, we started making those a little bit before kids started college, and we called them our tuition angels. They were, uh, they were something we made a lot of and sold a lot of, and people call today begging us to make, you know, another one, and Barbara says, no, I think by the time uh, Fletcher graduated, she said, that's the last angel oil lamp, there'll never be another one. You know, that's just a glass that, that I've melted onto the clay. And here are the ingredients. It's just like a biscuit recipe, flour. Plenty of potters buy their glazes commercially prepared, and there's nothing at all wrong with that. I'm gonna put a copper red runny glaze up here, and I want gravity to pull it down. But my background just makes me interested in making them, and I can come up with some mixed up. different and unusual things. He's laying on some of the broad colors now. As, as technology develops more and more, and I like technology too, but more and more we're removed from things touched by human hands and made by human hands. This all just, once it's full of pots, it'll all just roll in and I'll bolt this door down. There are two gas burners in the rear that shoot flame in. They get this front wall bounce up down through all the wear and out this glue and up the chimney. And it's, it's about a 14, 15 hour process in this particular kiln. But I'm kind of bad about getting on my tractor and bush hogging or mowing or something and forget. And two hours later, oh, the kiln! <laughs> Artists and craftsmen kind of like to romanticize their lives like they're live in some sort of nirvana, uh, you know, or a state of bliss when the actual day-to-day -day work is work. You certainly have your anxieties and your stresses and waking up at three o'clock in the morning and say, dear God, what am I doing? <laughs> what, what am I thinking? Well, you know, it, uh, I gotta go get a job. So much of this Arkansas Living Treasure Award that I got, uh, it should have been Barbara and Jim Larkin. Anything that we've accomplished, we've accomplished as a team and, and working together. And why I was lucky enough that we ended up together, I, I don't know. <laughs> when people come in and say, you know, they have for years, oh, I just trade everything I've got to be able to live like this. And they really wouldn't. Uh, they wouldn't trade their Mercedes and their big boat and their, you know, but they, but I take that as a compliment. Uh, uh, it has been an honor to, to, to have the life that we've had. You, know, you go down to a shipwreck from ancient Greece or whatever, and you find these M4, or you find things thousands of years old that are in wonderful condition, you know, whereas leather, wood, other things, you know, are, are gone. So there is that hope that your work, I don't care that anybody knows that Jim Larkin in Hot Springs, Arkansas made this, but I hope that when they pick it up, they'll say, boy, this is a nice shape. This has got nice lines. I really like the way this feels. Uh, um, I hope they recognize quality in it. That would be my, my big hope.